Welcome back, everybody. This is Nick from Part-Time Pilot, and this is episode number five of the Part-Time Pilot Audio Ground School. And in this episode, we are going to be talking about lesson seven of section two of our online ground school. So section one was an introduction, which we covered in episode one. Section two is operation of aircraft systems. We get into getting familiar with your aircraft and understanding how to use everything in your aircraft. Uh, Last episode, we went over the vacuum system, and today we're going to go over the pedostatic system and the instruments that are used in the pedostatic system. And if you can hear that loud plane that just came over, I'm going to leave that in. I've said this in a couple episodes. I'm going to say it one more time, but just so I don't get anybody like saying, what the heck's that noise, blah, blah, blah. When I uh, first did YouTube videos, I would always (laughs) sniff like that. And like I had people saying like, Oh, you're on drugs, like all this stuff. So I gotta I feel like I gotta do give a disclaimer, but I'm I'm at San Diego International Airport and so I decided I'm gonna leave that in instead of do the added extra work for me to take out all the sounds because this is an aviation podcast, so why not have that ambiance like you're here at the airport with me and I think you can still hear me okay. Let me know if not, but I think it should be fine. So let's get into section two, lesson seven on the pedostatic system. So we talked about the vacuum system, and that had the heading indicator, the attitude indicator, and sometimes the turn coordinator, which we talked about and discussed in the last episode. So how do the other major instruments inside a cockpit work? To answer that, we must understand both the pedo and the static systems on an aircraft. So that's the pedo, that's what they call the pedo-static system. So pedo air, also called ram air, is collected at the leading edge or front of the pedo head, usually found under one of the wings. So you see this like silver colored rod, almost kind of looks like a hot dog that comes to a point. Also looks like something else that I won't say, but uh, it comes to a point. It's a probe that points with the, and there's a hole that faces forward on the aircraft and it just hangs off the wing. It's kind of like an L shape and it's a probe. And the leading edge of that, that, that front hole directly receiving air as you travel through the air that's where the pedo air or ram air is collected right in that hole right at the front so as the air as you're flying through the air all those air molecules are going right into that hole at the front of the probe so for a cherokee warrior the pedo probe is below usually below the left wing at about the midpoint it consists of a free stream ram air inlet like we were talking about at the very front, and then a drain, which will be at the back before it curves upward and connects to to the wing. And now if you are a part of our online ground school, we have a diagram that shows it breaks down. It shows what it looks like inside. It shows it has its labeled the different parts of the pedostatic system. And this is something that on your check ride, your examiner might quiz you about. He might come over to uh, the pedo probe and say, what is this hole? Or what's the purpose of this hole? And then I'll go from there. You might even say like a scenario based questions like this hole's clogged. Like what what happens if this hole gets clogged? Stuff like that. And that's the kind of stuff we're going to cover in this lesson. So your aircraft may be equipped with a pedostatic probe rather than just a pedo probe. So the pedo probe collects pedo air. That's the free stream air. A pedostatic probe collects both ram or pedo air and static air. A pedostatic probe has three holes, one for the ram air that we talked about at the front, and one for static air, and then one for the drain. So it has the drain and, and the pedo ram air port at the front, and the drain in the back, and then it has static air, which are usually either on, so if you have like the sort of hot dog shape sticking, you know, into the wind, right on top of the hot dog it will be a little hole, and that's the static source, so it's not facing directly into the wind so because of that the wind is going by it and when the wind goes by it uh we'll we'll get into that more but there's a there's an area of air right there so such that that's where the static source collects from and so it's just as if you weren't moving and you were just collecting air you're collecting the air pressure as if you weren't moving at all through the air that's what the static source does that's why it's on the side and not the front because at the front it's going to get that impact pressure that air driving itself into that hole but the static source on the side, it's kind of where that calm air is. It's almost like drafting, like you're a NASCAR car drafting or you're, you're drafting behind like a big semi, 
right? If you are at the front of the semi, let's say you get taped to the front of a semi as it's going 60 miles an hour, you're going to feel that air hitting you in the face. But if you were to be strapped to the back of the semi, it would be calm air, right? You wouldn't be getting blasted by air in your face. It would be calm. That's static air. It's just as if you weren't moving you weren't moving 60 miles per hour as as if you were standing still. So that's the kind of difference of the two ports and the difference of either a pedo probe or a pedo static probe. So you want to know which one your aircraft has. Pedo air is used by the airspeed indicator only. So pedo air, again, is the the free stream air pressure that comes in from the front of the probe. The airspeed indicator finds a difference in pressure between the air collected by the pedo port, so again, that ram air coming in, and the static port. So again, that's like collecting the difference in pressure between when you're strapped to the front of a semi and when you're strapped to the back. You're going to feel a difference in air pressure. You're going to feel that on your face, on your skin, much different. The difference in that pressure is what the airspeed indicator finds. It's basically calculating that difference in those two pressures, and that's called the impact or dynamic pressure. Static air is usually picked up the same on the same pedo head, but the port is found on the back or bottom, as we talked about, the, the back or the, the top or bottom of the probe, where the atmosphere is static air. Your aircraft will also have an additional static port found, again, on the side of the aircraft's fuselage. So it's not at the front where it will be getting that impact pressure, feeling that air hitting it in the face. It's on the side where it's getting that calm static air. Furthermore, there is a usually a backup source found in the cabin, and as a pilot, you want to know where this is for your aircraft. It's usually different, and this is for the scenario where your static ports outside the aircraft get clogged during a flight. It'll allow you to still collect static air and provide that static air to the instruments so your instruments work correctly. For a Cherokee Warrior, usually the alternate cabin source is found below and to the left side of the instrument panel. If you're sitting in the pilot seat, static air is used by the airspeed indicator, the altimeter, and the vertical speed indicator. So we had pedo air that was only used by the airspeed indicator. The only reason we have pedo air probes is for the airspeed indicator. Nothing else uses the pedo air probes. The static probes are used by quite a few things. They're used by the airspeed indicator, again, because the airspeed indicator takes a difference of that pedo air and static air. It's used by the altimeter, and it's used by the vertical speed indicator. In the event of a static source clog or failure, all str- all three instruments will show a faulty indication. So again, airspeed indicator uses both pedo and static air. Altimeter and VSI use static air only. In the course lesson, you're going to sh- see a figure that shows the locations of the pedo probes and the static sources even the backup static source on a typical aircraft. So we show that there. And then in the show notes, I'm going to put a video that we have of how the pedo static system works. So I'll put that link in the show notes for you to watch that video and get that helpful visual aid. So now I want to get into the instruments of the pedo static system, which we already talked about. That's the airspeed indicator. It's the altimeter and it's the vertical speed indicator or VSI. And the first one I want to talk about is the airspeed indicator. And I kind of addressed this already on how it works, but let's get into a little bit more detail. It's very important that as a pilot, you know how your instruments work when something goes wrong, how they might be affected. For the airspeed indicator, in order to determine the airspeed, it needs to calculate the difference between the ram or pedo pressure. So that pressure that's coming into the front of the pedo probe and the static pressure. And this difference in the, in the pedo or ram pressure and the static pressure is called the dynamic pressure. But why does it need to calculate this pressure? It needs to calculate the dynamic pressure because it depends on the velocity of the free stream air. That dynamic pressure is directly related to the velocity of the free stream air. It's how dynamic that air is. It's the pressure caused by that velocity. The only difference between the pitot air and the static air is the pitot air is air moving at the airspeed relative to the aircraft and the static air is simply static or unmoving air relative to the aircraft. Mathematically, the velocity or airspeed can be determined by the equation for dynamic pressure after solving for velocity. So if you are in the online ground school, you can see a an image of this equation, but it just says V or velocity equals, and this is all under the square root. So the square root of two times the difference of the total pressure or the pedo pressure 
and the static pressure, and then all of that is over the density. So go take a look at that. What that shows is the airspeed is determined by the difference in that total or pitot pressure and the static pressure, and it's also affected by the density. So how does the airspeed make this calculation? In the airspeed indicator, is there a computer or a calculator or some some sort of a device like that? No, the airspeed indicator is much more primitive and durable because it's used for many, many years in the same way way past before computers. So to do that, the airspeed indicator takes pitot or ram air from the pitot probe and it flows directly into a flexible and sealed diaphragm called an aneroid wafer. You kind of think of this as like a balloon or accordion that sort of when it fills up with pressure, it, it expands. And then when the pressure gets lower, it deflates. And remember, this pitot air holds the dynamic pressure, which constitutes the difference between static and pitot pressure. The static air at static pressure enters the airspeed indicator in, into a reservoir that surrounds this aneroid wafer or this balloon. When the aircraft has no airspeed, the pitot pressure is the same as the static pressure. There's no speed, there's no air velocity coming into that pitot probe, so it's just collecting that static air just like the static port. And so the dynamic pressure would be zero because, again, the pitot pressure or total pressure equals the static pressure. When the aircraft has airspeed, the dynamic pressure is not zero, and therefore the pitot pressure is greater than the static pressure. So the difference in pitot pressure and static pressure is a positive number. Therefore, when the total pitot pressure inside the wafer is larger, in this case, when there's airspeed, than the static pressure surrounding it, that wafer or that balloon, because it's a higher pressure inside, is going to expand because that high pressure wants to go to low pressure area outside of the balloon, pushes on the walls of the wafer or the balloon and make, causes it to expand. Again, this is due to the force exerted outwards from the inside of the wafer due to the high pressure air within wants you to expand to the lower pressure air surrounding it. And this is just the definition of pressure. Pressure is the continual force on a container or a surface from either a gas, liquid, or solid. So the pressure inside that wafer is pushing on the walls, the outer walls of that wafer or that balloon, and causing it to expand when the pressure outside of that, the static pressure, is lower than it. When the wafer expands, it spins a calibrated gear system, so that expansion causes these gears to spin, and they're calibrated perfectly, so the amount of expansion is equal to the amount of specific turns in the gears and that converts that expansion and contraction of the wafer into movement of the needle on the airspeed indicator face at the front of the instrument so as that wafer expands it spins these gears and those gears move that needle and show an increase in airspeed on the airspeed indicator and when that wafer decreases the gears spin the opposite way and that needle shows a decrease in airspeed. And if you're in the ground school, I want you to check out the, the diagram of this. You have the air coming into the pitot probe and the static source. It shows where the static air is going and surrounding this wafer. And then it shows the pitot air going into the wafer. And you can kind of see how the wafer can expand. And then you have a little gear system which takes that expansion or contraction of the wafer and turns it into rotational motion on the gears, which then turns it to spin the needle. It's a very, very cool instrument. When I learned about how these worked, it made me think of like in fifth grade when I did a Rube Goldberg, Rube Goldberg project. I don't know if you guys ever did that where you use six simple machines. You use like a wedge, you use a spiral, and you make something happen. Like you, you can see YouTube videos of this where like, you know, they'll have a ball roll down a ramp and hit some dominoes and then all the dominoes will fall and then it'll cut some other rope or something like that that's what this remind these instruments remind me of you know it was back a long time ago when we came up with these and it's just very simple machines that are very reliable and once you understand them they're, they're pretty easy to understand and then we have a video that shows all this and i'll link that in the show notes on how the airspeed indicator works uh, so check that out if you're not in the online ground school and even if you are in the online ground school you got to check out those visual aids so you can understand, get a good grip of what I'm talking about. All right, let's go on to the next instrument, which is the altimeter. The altimeter uses static air only. So the airspeed indicator used static and pitot. 
Airspeed indicator is the only instrument that uses that pitot air. Uh, the altimeter uses static air only, and it converts that static air pressure to an altitude. The altimeter makes use of a known relationship between air pressure and altitude. As altitude increases, the air pressure decreases at a fairly predictable rate of about one inch of mercury per 1,000 feet of altitude. Now I'm going to repeat that because this is something you'll want to remember for the FAA written exam. One inch of mercury every 1,000 feet of altitude gain. So as you gain altitude by 1,000 feet, you're going to have a decrease in one inch of mercury. And why mercury? Well, mercury is a special substance. It's a very heavy liquid. So it's, it's a metal. It's a very heavy metal, and it's in liquid form because of melting point. It's in liquid form at most temperatures that we live in. They use it for instruments like barometers and stuff like this. They calibrate it, these instruments, so that one inch rise, you know, when the temperature changes, the mercury expands and changes in volume, expands and contracts. And so one inch rise in mercury in a little tube is equal to about a thousand foot altitude gain. They've calibrated the size of that tube so that that's what that's how it happens. And that's just the standard we use. And mercury is easily contracts and expands. All right, static air from the static source fills the altimeter reservoir. Again, take a look in the ground school at this, and then we also have another video on this, which I'll put in the show notes on how the altimeter works. So go check that out so you can get a visual of what I'm talking about. Inside the instrument, if you've ever seen, I should have said this for the airspeed indicator, but you have the face of the instrument, and then behind it, it's like a cylinder. And it's almost like a can of beans or something, right, where the instrument face that you see in the cockpit is on the top of the can, that just that round part that you see on the six-pack. But behind that is a cylinder, and that's where all this stuff goes on. That's where the gears are, the wafer I talked about in the airspeed indicator and the balloons, and where it collects the reservoirs, where it collects the air, is all back there in that can part. So static air from the static source fills that can part, the altimeter reservoir. Again, a flexible sealed diaphragm called an aneroid wafer, that balloon we're talking about. There's another one in the altimeter. It lies inside the altimeter and is filled with gas set to sea level pressure, which is 29.92 inches of mercury. So before, on the airspeed indicator, we had that aneroid wafer being filled up by our dynamic pressure from our airspeed, right? The pitot air would come in and it would fill up. It would go straight into our wafer. Well, this wafer on the altimeter is actually sealed. There's nothing coming in or out of this wafer, and it's sealed with a gas set to sea level pressure. So we've taken, grabbed a cup of sea level air and we've shoved it into this balloon, basically, and we've sealed the balloon and we just have that balloon sitting inside of our altimeter. When the static air, and then remember, static air is being filled around this balloon. When the static air surrounding the wafer is equal to sea level pressure, the wafer is unmoved. It doesn't change size, right? Because the pressure inside the wafer, the balloon, is the same as the pressure outside. So there's no force exerting on the balloon either way, either from the inside to the outside or from the outside in, because the pressures are equal. However, if the static pressure rises, like on a warm day or at a lower altitude, you're going to have a higher static pressure, and it's going to fill the reservoir of the altimeter, and it's going to fill around this balloon. The wafer will contract due to the larger pressure pressing on it from the outside of the balloon. When that static pressure around the balloon is higher than sea level, because again, we have sea level pressure inside the balloon, that higher pressure is going to push on the outside of that balloon, causing it to contract and get smaller in size. And then if the static pressure drops, like on a cold day or as you increase altitude, the static pressure around the balloon is going to drop, the wafer will expand because now the static pressure is below sea level pressure, so that means the sea level pressure inside the balloon is actually higher than the static pressure outside of it, so the pressure is going to push outwards from the inside of the balloon on the walls of the balloon, causing it to expand. Since the static pressure inside the altimeter and surrounding the wafer will match that of the atmosphere, as you climb, so again, remember, we have the static ports on our aircraft, and we have a line that goes from the static ports and fills the altimeter around this balloon. So because of that, because it matches the atmospheric pressure, that static pressure, as you climb, or on a cold day, 
the pressure inside the altimeter, that static pressure, will decrease below sea level pressure and the wafers will expand outward into the lower surrounding pressure and the altimeter needle will spin to a high altitude. So again, we have this sort of gear system connected to the wafer so that when it expands or contracts, those gears spin and then the gears are connected to the needles on the face of the instrument and they're calibrated such that a, a certain level of expansion increase in volume equals a certain change in altitude on the instrument. And then as you descend or on a warm day, the static pressure inside the altimeter will rise and may even rise above sea level pressure, causing the wafer to contract and the altimeter needle will spin to a lower altitude. So again, if you're in the online ground school, go to the pedo static system lesson lesson number seven of section two and check out these diagrams of what these instruments look like on the inside and how they work and then check out the show notes so you can see a visual of what we're talking about here another component of the, of the altimeter that you will see is the altimeter setting adjustment knob and this is on the face of the altimeter that's used by the pilots and then it's connected to the altimeter setting window these components allow a pilot to adjust their instrument for non-standard atmospheric conditions. The altimeter determines altitude by using the difference in the static pressure and the standard sea level pressure of 29.92 inches of mercury as an aircraft climbs or descends. So remember, and the way it computes that, that difference is by that balloon contracting or expanding. Remember, because we have sea level pressure inside the balloon. So when you have higher static pressure surrounding it, the balloon's gonna contract. When you have lower static pressure surrounding it, the balloon's going to expand. And in a perfect world where that sea level pressure that we have contained inside that balloon, inside that wafer, matches the sea level pressure at our location, wherever we are, like I'm in San Diego and I'm at sea level and the pressure today, it could be sea level, but it could be a non-standard day and the pressure could be non, non-standard at sea level right now. So on a standard day, the sea level pressure is 29.92 inches mercury. But on a non-standard day, like when the temperature is higher or lower than the standard temperature, which affects the pressure, sea level pressure is no longer 29.92 inches of mercury. Therefore, your altimeter is working off of a reference point that is no longer accurate. Remember, because inside that wafer, we think it's 29.92. That's the air pressure inside that wafer. Because on a standard day, that's what sea level pressure is. But if it's not a standard day, your altimeter is going to have an inaccurate reading because sea level pressure is no longer 29.92 on that day. So to compensate for this, a pilot simply turns the altimeter setting adjustment knob until they see the current ground air pressure in the altimeter setting window. So you'll get this from the METARs and the tower They'll tell you to adjust your altimeter settings accordingly. They'll give periodic updates every 30 minutes or so. And they might say, instead of 29.92, they might say 30.02. And you'd want to change your altimeter setting so that in the altimeter setting window, it now equals 30.02. This recalibrates the altimeter to the non-standard air temperature and pressure, ensuring that the reported altitude is accurate. So the, the altitude on your the face of your altimeter is going to be accurate. If an altimeter setting or ground pressure reading is not available before flight, a pilot should set the altimeter so that it reads the departure airport's elevation. So let's say you're at some airport where there's not an automatic METAR or there's not a reading that gives you the air pressure. You should set it, you should turn the altimeter setting knob until your altimeter reads the elevation that you're at. So if you're on ground, you're on taxi, before you taxi out and your elevation, it you know that the elevation of this airport is 500 feet, you want to spin the altimeter setting adjustment knob until your altimeter reads 500 feet and then whatever is it reads in your altimeter setting window, this is the current pressure at your elevation. So you set that before you take off and then you periodically reset it. And then if you are flying above 18,000 feet, which as a private pilot, you won't do, but if you continue on to higher performance aircraft that can climb higher, and if you are in class A, class alpha, above 18,000 feet, all altimeters are required to be set to 29.92. This is just so that everybody is on the same page and all the altimeters are reading off the same reference point.
Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about what the altimeter setting does and how you might be tested on the FAA written about this. So when a pilot makes an increase in the altimeter setting, the indicated altitude on the instrument will also increase at the rate of 1,000 feet per inch of mercury increase in the setting. So if the pilot decreases the altimeter setting, then they will see a decrease in the indicated altitude. But wait a minute. I mean, doesn't altitude increase with a decrease in pressure? Yes, it does, but that is not what's happening with our instrument. The instrument measures, again, the difference between sea level pressure and static pressure at your actual altitude. So if you are at an altitude where the pressure is 25 inches of mercury, and you increase your altimeter setting from 29 inches of mercury to 30 inches of mercury, you're increasing the difference between the two numbers. So at first, you're at an alt altitude where the pressure is 25 inches of mercury. And your sea level pressure that you have set is 29 inches of mercury. So your altimeter is calculating that difference. 29 minus 25 equals 4 inches of mercury. And it's using that difference to determine an altitude on that it indicates. When you increase that altimeter setting from 29 inches of mercury to 30 inches of mercury, you have increased the difference between the two numbers. So now 30 minus 25 is 5 inches of mercury, and you'll therefore see a rise in the indicated altitude on your instrument because it sees a bigger difference between your current pressure, where you're at, the static pressure that you're collecting, and the altimeter setting that you are saying is the sea level pressure. So that difference has increased, so you have a bigger difference in the two numbers, which is a higher altitude or a bigger altitude away from sea level. The altimeter setting adjustment knob allows for real-time corrections by the pilot for non-standard atmospheric temperatures. So remember that the altimeter setting adjustment knob allows for real-time corrections by the pilot for non-standard atmospheric temperatures. And when a temperature changes, so does the pressure. And this is a good time to say one thing to always remember is that when we're talking about the atmosphere and we're talking about altimeters and stuff like that, remember that pressure goes with temperature. So if you have a rise in temperature, you'll get a rise in pressure. If you have a decrease in temperature, you're going to get a decrease in pressure. So just remember those things as we move on and we do FAA written questions and stuff like that. It's going to help you determine what's happening to your altimeter when you fly from cold to hot weather, for example, and things like that. All right, so now I want to talk about how to read an altimeter. And it, this is best, probably best learned visually, which you can, again, we'll, we have another video for this on how to read an altimeter, which I will post, again, in the show notes. I'll try and post all the videos that, that I reference and that we have in the online ground school. We also have visual pictures and step-by-step -step instructions in the online ground school that you can check out. And if you're, again, if you're not in that online ground school, go to www.parttimepilot.com and just click on online ground school and you'll be able to follow along on all this stuff. And then after each lesson, we have the quizzes, which reinforce the information. All right, so an altimeter has three needles. It has a 10,000-foot needle. It has a 1,000-foot needle. And finally, it has a 100-foot needle. And the figure in our lesson, it has the 10,000-foot needle as the shortest, skinniest needle. It's got the 1,000-foot needle as the fattest, kind of mid-length needle. And then it has a 100-foot needle as the longest skinny needle. Now, not all altimeters are the same. This is probably the most common altimeter that I took a picture of. So you'll want to make sure that you know which needle is which for your specific altimeter. Sometimes altimeters have like real skinny long needles or they'll have real fat ones. And, and each one will mean something different. Once you start using it, you'll be able to tell... Just when you're climbing out on that first climb out, you'll be able to see which one is moving the fastest. That's the 100 foot needle. You know, which one's moving second fastest as you climb. That's the 1,000 foot needle, and so on and so forth. It'll be easy to tell when you're actually experiencing this. But when you're learning this in ground, you can do some YouTube videos and see how that is. But again, know your actual altimeter and what the needles mean on your specific altimeter. They might not be the exact same, but again, this is probably the most common. So to read an altimeter, a pilot should follow the following steps. Set the correct altimeter setting with the adjustment knob, as we talked about before. This ensures you are getting an accurate, as accurate an altitude reading and a true altitude, which is the height above sea level. So you want to try to always get a true altitude, which is your height above sea level. 
to do that, you always have to be calibrated to the exact atmospheric pressure at sea level, which is what ATC and METARs are going to tell you to update you know, continuously throughout your flight. So if you do that, you'll have the best, most accurate reason reading as we possibly can. Then, first read the 10,000-foot needle. So again, know which one is the 10,000-foot needle. And if this pointer is less than one, you are less than 10,000 feet of altitude, and you will use zero as your 10,000-foot reading. So you know you're not above 10,000 feet, so the 10,000-foot reading, we're going to remember that as zero. If this pointer is between one and two, then that tells you you're above 10,000 feet and below 20,000 feet, so you're going to use 10,000 feet as your 10,000-foot reading. What this says is it says, okay, the minimum altitude we are is 10,000 feet when that needle is between 1 and 2. When that pointer or needle is between 2 and 3, you know that the minimum altitude you're going to be at is 20,000 feet and the maximum you're going to be at is 30,000 feet. So when it's between 2 and 3, we're going to use 20,000 as our 10,000 foot reading. And it continues for each number around the dial. So basically, you just want to use, you want to understand that if it's the needles between 0 and 1, then you're going to start with 0, and we're going to go from there and look at the other needles. If your needle is between 1 and 2, you're going to start at 10,000, and we're going to start there and work our way up with the other needles. And if it's between 2 and 3, you're going to start as 20,000 as your base, and we're going to work up from there. So next, we read the 1,000-foot needle. And we, again, we do a very similar thing. If the pointer is less than 1, then you're less than 1,000 feet of altitude, and you will use zero as your thousand foot reading if it's between one and two we're going to use again we're between one thousand and two thousand feet so we're going to use a thousand feet as your thousand foot reading and again if it's between two and three we're going to use two thousand feet as our reading and go on from there and it continues for each number around the dial and then what we'll do is we'll add this thousand foot reading to our ten thousand foot reading so let's say our ten thousand foot needle was between zero and one so our ten thousand foot reading is zero we use that the lowest number as our 10,000 foot reading. Then our 1,000 foot needle, let's say that was between 4 and 5. So again, we use the lowest one. We use that 4, which would be 4,000. And we add that to our 10,000 foot reading, which we said was 0. So now we have 0 plus 4,000. We have 4,000 feet. And now we can get even more specific by reading the 100 foot needle. And for this needle, we will read the needle exactly how it lies on the altimeter. We will not do the thing where we say, okay, if it's between 1 and 2, we're going to use 100 you know, or 1,000 or whatever. So we're just going to read it exactly how it is on this one because this is the final most specific needle. So each number on the altimeter is in hundreds of feet, and there are five ticks between each number. So each tick is 20 feet. So if our 100-foot needle points on the third tick between 3 and 4, this would be a reading of at least 300 and then 3 ticks. Each one is 20, so that would be a reading of 360 feet. So let's go back to our example. Let's say we had our biggest needle was between 0 and 1, so that's a 10,000-foot reading of 0. Let's say our 1,000-foot needle was between 4 and 5, so that we know that we're going to use that 4 as 4,000, so we add zero to four thousand we get four thousand and now let's say our hundred foot needle was on the third tick after the three so the three means three hundred the third tick means each tick is twenty so that's three sixty so three sixty we add that to our our zero reading and our four thousand reading so we get zero plus four thousand plus three sixty we get four thousand three hundred and sixty feet now this sounds like pretty dang difficult but it's actually pretty intuitive once you start to do it there's lots of examples you can get online and we have a lot of examples in our quiz in our course to test your knowledge of this and once you've done it probably 15 to 20 times it's going to start coming intuitive to you this is another reason why i tell people to do ground school before they get into flight training because when you learn stuff like this how to read your instruments once you get in the airplane it's going to be so much easier you're not going to be I mean, just think about how much easier that is to fly when you're not trying to figure out how to read the altimeter. When you can look at the altimeter and just in a couple seconds determine your altitude, it's going to be so much easier. You're going to know, okay, I'm, I'm at the correct altitude I need to be. I'm not going to bust this class Bravo airspace. I'm going to clear this terrain. I'm in traffic pattern altitude. 
blah, 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 whatever it is, you're going to be able to do that in one to two seconds rather than trying to figure out, again, how is it that I read this altimeter again, asking your instructor. And when that happens, when you're behind, that, that's what I mean when I say you're mentally behind the aircraft. It's going to take 30 seconds to a minute to figure that out. And in that 30 seconds to a minute, there could be incoming traffic in your way. There could be, you know, your engine pressure or oil temperature might be rising. You might have an emergency on your hands that you are not noticing because you are behind mentally of the aircraft. You're trying to figure out the altimeter. So that's why it's so important to, again, go through the ground school, know how to do this stuff before you start flight training. Another example is if you're you're practicing your maneuvers, you're doing uh, turns around a point where you have to keep it within 100 feet of altitude, you know, plus or minus 100 feet of altitude. And if you're trying to understand what altitude you're at on your altimeter, you're not going to be able to focus as much on the controls and the feel of your aircraft. And you're probably going to do worse on the maneuvers. And when you can't get a maneuver down, what happens? Your instructor is going to say, all right, we got to practice this again. That means you have to do another lesson. And lessons are what? They're expensive. So you're going to have to fly again with your instructor. You're going to again pay for the you know, the gas and the, the rental fee of the aircraft. It's going to be two, $300, all because you didn't know how to read your instruments. So get this stuff down. Do your ground school so that you can make flying easier on yourself. So many, I believe this is the number one reason, this and costs, but this has a direct effect on costs. But this is the number one reason why so many student pilots fail because they put so much pressure on themselves. They try and learn all this knowledge at the same time as flying. And it's just put so much stress. They're going to have to redo lessons and that makes it more expensive and it's already super expensive. And then finally they just run out of money and they're like, I can't do this anymore. And they end up quitting or they fail a test, get in trouble, make a mistake, crash something because they're mentally behind. So can't stress enough figuring this stuff out first, getting a good ground school like ours, going through it, listening to this podcast, watching videos, figuring out how to read your instruments, all this knowledge that we're going to go through in this podcast. So anyways, that's my spiel. That's my rant right there. Let's do another example of an altimeter. If you're in the course, you can see the labeled altimeter in the picture. So we, we see the skinny 10,000 foot needle just sits slightly under the one. So again, this gives us a 10,000 foot reading because it's under that one of zero. It's under the one, so we use the lowest one. It's between zero and one, so we use zero. The thick thousand foot needle is above the nine, so it's between the nine and the ten or the last notch. So that's going to give us a thousand foot reading of nine thousand. So so far we have zero, and then nine thousand. So zero plus nine thousand is nine thousand feet. The hundred foot needle we can see is right at the five, which gives us a reading of five hundred feet. So again, we add zero plus nine thousand plus five hundred. That's nine thousand. 500 feet for that reading on that example and again i have more examples and quiz questions that you'll see like on the fa written in the quiz on, on this lesson and then we also provide an example in the video which i'll link in the show notes okay so yeah check out those videos on how the altimeters work and how to read an altimeter and then uh, the last pedostatic instrument that i want to talk about is a vertical speed indicator or vsi so similar to the altimeter, the vertical speed indicator, or VSI, uses the expansion and contraction of aneroid wafers, uh, or that balloon, and converts this vertical movement into rotational movement on the VOI dial on the front of the instrument, so that needle on the v VSI, by way of a calibrated system of gears. So it works very similarly to the airspeed indicator or, and the altimeter, how that balloon, when it expands and contracts, it turns some gears, and then those gears eventually are calibrated to, to make the needle move on the face of the aircraft or face of the instrument. However, the VSI is different than the altimeter in that the, the wafer is not sealed with gas at sea level pressure. Instead, the wafer is fed directly by the static air source and gets filled with static air. So in the airspeed indicator case, we have the balloon or wafer getting filled by pedo air, which you know is caused by the airspeed. And then in the altimeter, we had that wafer completely sealed with sea level pressure, and we have static pressure around it. And then in the VSI, we have static air filling. So we have a line of, from our static air source 
going directly into that wafer or balloon on the VSI, and so it's filled with static air. So whatever altitude you're at, that static air is going to be filled in into the balloon or wafer inside the VSI instrument. And again, the air surrounding the wafer inside the reservoir of the instrument, so inside the can part behind the face of the instrument that surrounds the balloon, it's also filled with air. And if the air pressure surrounding the wafer is higher than the static air inside the wafer, the wafer is going to contract, right? Because the pressure on the outside is, is higher, so it's going to make it shrink in size. The air pressure surrounding the wafer is lower than the static air inside the wafer uh, will expand. And same concept, I, I just thought of a good metaphor. Have you ever brought a, either a plastic bottle or a pack of chips onto an airplane? So that pack of chips was essentially sealed with sea level pressure. Airplanes are, their cabins are sealed and they're pressurized to try and maintain that sea level pressure. But when you get really high in altitude, like 40,000 feet, they don't keep it. They, they would have to pump a lot of air to keep it at sea level pressure. So they don't really keep it at sea level pressure. I think they do like something like 8,000 feet of pressure so that they don't have to use as much, much air and bring as much air on board. Um, and 8,000 feet is still safe for people. I'm not sure about that number, but someone can correct me if I'm wrong. But so it's still higher than sea level pressure. So when you, that bag of chips, when you climb up to altitude in, you know, in that, on the flight you're on, it's going to be the air around you in the cabin of the aircraft is going to be at a pressure much lower than sea level pressure. So the pressure inside the bag of chips is now going to be much higher than outside. So it's going to want to expand and come out of the bag. So that's why your bag fills up really high or the, or your plastic bottle fills up really high and wants to pop right when you get up to altitude. So that's, that's why. And that, so these same concepts we're using that bag of chips is like this balloon or this aneroid wafer inside our instruments. So the instruments reservoir we talked about is also filled with static air, except in the case of the VSI, the static air into the reservoir that surrounds the wafer is actually metered by a nozzle. And this is referred to as a calibrated leak. And this calibrated leak is, is the key reason why a VSI can work. And, and we'll get to that. We'll try and explain it as best we can. And you can see, again, if you're in the ground school, you can see this picture. And then, again, we'll have a video on how VSI works, and I'll post that in the show notes. But this metered leak in and out of the instrument, so we have the can, the reservoir can, and you have a nozzle that slowly leaks static air at a metered amount outside of the can. And the metered leak in and out of the instrument means that the air pressure inside the instrument will match the static air pressure after a lag or a delay caused by the metered nozzle. So during the delay, the pressures will not match, and the difference causes the expansion and contraction of the wafer and a reading of non-zero on the front of the VSI. The metered delay allows for the calculation of a rate of climb or descent. So let me try and explain that again. So we have inside the balloon, we have static air. Outside of the balloon, in the reservoir of the instrument, we also have static air. But then we have a nozzle that allows air to leak out or come in depending on whether you're going up in altitude and decreasing in pressure or you're going down in altitude and increasing in pressure. So when you're climbing, the pressure outside of your instrument, completely outside of your instrument, as you climb, is going to get lower. And the pressure inside the instrument is going to want to leak out of the instrument to equalize with the new lower pressure outside of the instrument as you climb up. So, And then it, that nozzle makes it so that that leak happens at a calibrated speed or rate. And so when that happens, we again, we have the balloon connected directly to static with no nozzle. So the balloon is going to change, in, the pressure inside the balloon is going to change pressure at the same speed or rate as the actual pressure outside your aircraft. So as you climb and you get a decrease in pressure, the pressure outside of your aircraft is going to decrease and it's going to cause the pressure inside your balloon to decrease at the same rate because it's just directly connected to that pressure with no nozzle. But the pressure inside the instrument surrounding the balloon is going to decrease at a slower rate. So it's going to lag behind. So if you climb 
from 1,000 feet to 2,000 feet, you're going to drop an inch of mercury in static pressure. So the air inside the balloon is going to drop by one inch of mercury, the pressure inside the balloon. But the air inside your instrument is going to want to decrease in that time, the time it takes for you to climb from 1,000 to 2,000 feet. It's going to want to decrease an inch of mercury in that time, but the instrument is not letting it because we have that metered nozzle. So it's going to s decrease slower. And that delay in decrease will cause the pressure inside your instrument surrounding the balloon to be different than the pressure inside the balloon. So the pressure inside your balloon is going to be lower than the pressure outside, so it's actually going to contract the balloon as you climb. And that's going to spin the gears. Remember, it's connect the balloon's connected to gears, and it's going to move that VSI needle accordingly. And then once you level off, and after a couple seconds... And you can actually see this on your VSI needle. When you level off, it's going to take a second or two for that VSI needle to go back down to zero, even though you've leveled off at an altitude. And it's because that leg, that air inside your instrument, is still trying to get out of that metered nozzle. And it has a, a bit of a leg, a couple second leg, until that air can be equal or equalize with the air, the actual static air outside of your aircraft and inside the balloon. Now... I hope I explained that well. Another thing that these instruments, some of the newer instruments use is an acceleration pump, which sort of calibrates that leak more and pumps it, pumps the air in and out at a, a quicker rate so that there still is a leg, but the leg is quicker so that your VSI needle uh, reads more accurately and doesn't have as much leg as I was talking about uh, because of that acceleration pump. So if you're still confused, here's an example, and you can go in the course, and this, is, this will be in the video as well in the show notes. As an aircraft climbs, the static pressure inside the wafer goes down. The air inside the instrument that surrounds the wafer also wants to go down, but it cannot reach the new pressure as fast as the air inside the wafer because the flow of air is metered into and out of the instrument. Therefore, during the climb... The pressure inside the wafers is lower than the pressure outside the wafers, and the wafers will contract and raise the VSI dial to show a climb. Once the air inside the instrument is able to completely leak out to the atmosphere and it's equal to the static pressure, the wafers will expand back to neutral and the VSI dial will go back down to zero. And in this picture, we show an aircraft climbing from one altitude to another, what the relationship and pressures are at those different altitudes, and then what the relationship of the pressures inside the, the wafer or balloon, inside the instrument, and then also inside the air, and what the VSI is doing at those different altitudes, and what how air is leaking in and out of the instrument. So it's a very visual sort of thing. It's hard to kind of explain just to it on audio. So please go check out the video so you can see that example. All right, guys, that has been the VSI, the altimeter, and the airspeed indicator is all that makes up the pitot-static system. We also talked about the instruments that collect, the probes that collect pitot air and static air. So you have the static sources and, and the pitot probes. We talked about that as well. We talked about how each instrument works. I hope you guys found that useful. Again, go check out the videos. This concept might need that visual aid for you to fully grasp it. And then please join us for the next lesson. We'll go on to lesson eight of section two. So again, section two of our online ground schools operation of aircraft systems. And lesson eight is going to be all about the magnetic compass. And the magnetic compass is a pretty big topic because of the airs associated with it, which we'll get to in the next episode. So we might just do that episode completely on the magnetic compass. But we, if we do have time, we'll get to transponders. That's lesson nine, transponders. I'll tell you all about transponders, how to use them, what they're for and the rules and requirements around them. So thank you for listening, and we'll see you next week.